Um, so my name is uh, Henry Lucendor. I'm uh, the founder uh, and CEO of Promoting Economic uh, Pluralism. And uh, uh, just to give, I don't know how many people have, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, people who come here regularly. Uh, but uh, Promoting Economic Pluralism is, that pluralism is about trying to get more voices, more perspectives, more different schools of thought into how we think about the economy. And that's from academia, but also how we run the economy in companies uh, and so on, to, to open us out so we can innovate and find new ways of organising our economy that's actually sustainable, resilient and inclusive. Uh, so, but until we have that space to think differently and have different ideas, we're not really going to get there. So that's the, that's the sort of basic idea. And as part of this, we have these uh, uh, monthly events where we invite various people to come along and talk uh, on different topics and also, but most important, we also have engagement and discussion and hear voices from, uh, from the audience and so on. So we, we'll get to that and then we have the most important bit of the evening, uh, it's glasses of wine and glasses of further discussion uh, and uh, to, you know, to get to know each other and so on. So um, it's great you're all here. Uh, now this evening, uh, we're very lucky to have three great speakers and I'm going to actually ask them, I think, to introduce themselves uh, briefly, uh, one by one, before uh, we start actually opening uh, the topic and so on, and I can sit down. Um, so I'll ask Anne Pettibol, who's one of our trustees, uh, who's been a supporter of PET from its inception uh, back in September 2016, uh, but is actually known for other things, funny enough. I think this should be the most famous thing. Uh, down the track, when, you're, when you look to the history, the one thing will stand out, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, so my name's Anne Pettibol, and I'm director of a, a network of Keynesian monetary theorists, monetary economists, um, called PRIME Economics, Policy Research in Macroeconomics. Prime economics as opposed to subprime economics. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, also an advisor to uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the, the Labour Party, and I'm now part of something called the Progressive Economy Forum, which is advising uh, the uh, opposition party on uh, policies, economic policies for the future. We're independent, but uh, we uh, we are discussing with them the proposals that we have. So that's briefly who I am. Great. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Alex Wade from the Institute. Of, well, are you here as sort of Institute of Actuaries? Yeah, well, I'm not quite sure why I'm here. Yes, uh, that's why you're here. My name's Alex Wade. I'm a, a partner at a firm called Lane Park and Peacock. We're Actuaries. Uh, we're about 100 yards that way. Uh, so you might think that Henry just found me wandering around <laughs> the street, dragged me in here. Uh, which isn't quite true, but not that far from the truth. Um, about a week ago, Henry found me chairing a meeting of the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries. Uh, I was chairing a meeting, uh, similar size to this, about having a bit more, you might call it pluralism, inside the actuarial profession, looking at how we can have more wide thinking about economics uh, as actuaries. Uh, and therefore, it was a bit of a meeting of minds, and, and I got... Dragged along here. So, uh, absolutely no free lunch. Really, really delighted to be here. Although, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's very heterodox to be wearing a tie. There's a few of us today, but you know, feel a bit more like part of the establishment. So, sorry. I meant a bit of imposter syndrome, maybe. <laughs> well, listen, we, we, we welcome all types tie wearing and non tie wearing. Okay? Uh, and uh, Leon wants to even uh, from um, LSE. Yeah. Hello, together. So, uh, my name is Leon Lansing. I'm um, assistant professor at the London School of Economics, but not in economics, not in management, not in accounting, but in sociology. Um, I'm an, what, what is called economic sociologist. Uh, maybe we get the chance to speak a bit about what this means. I mean, part obviously of economic sociology is having a critical dialogue with sort of core assumptions in economics in terms of economic behavior, the workings of markets, the role of institutions and so forth. Uh, and I'm also a convener of a degree that's called Economy, Risk and Society. So we are sort of also involved in this initiative uh, of Henry's of sort of establishing tourist degrees uh, because this degree that we have attracts people interested in so economic sociology, but there are not too many of them. So we also get students who don't get into economics and then we have to teach them that maybe <laughs> it's a good idea that they ended up with us. So yeah, 
and that's maybe for now. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Neil. I'll have to learn to pronounce your name. <laughs> <laughs> a name that's Van Slim, so it's Van Slim. German name. So. Right. Yeah. Having a name that's totally impossible to pronounce as well. I, I, it's should, difficult I should make a better, yeah. Yeah. better effort of that. No uh, brilliant. Now, we've got an interesting situation here where I've got a sort of flower, sort of a. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, should we take them down? Oh, just, I just they're, so they're, they are very gorgeous. If you put them on the side, it does seem a bit yeah. strange having that sort of a uh, total bag. Now, quite often we have one speaker who starts doing a, a sort of like extended presentation, and then we have a uh, uh, sort of respondent and so forth. Well, we're trying for a, a different format this time. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask three questions uh, and ask each of the uh, panelists to, to give an answer, uh, and then we'll open uh, to the floor. Uh, so I've chosen some sort of broad-based questions to sort of cover the territory, and then, and then we can sort of uh, uh, see what people want to discuss uh, from there. Um, so, my first question, should you wish to answer it or not, <laughs> is what do you understand by a pluralist approach to economics and things like that? Well, um, I think that what I understand by that is that economics should be taught as, as being diverse, and that there are diverse philosophies, there's diverse approaches, there's diverse analyses. And students should learn about all these, these different streams within the economics profession. Uh, in physics, for example, there, there's a range of views of the way in which the world works, and, and students have to learn that. They don't, they don't get taught you know, a single uh, truth. So for me, pluralism means uh, for universities and for students, and for schools for that matter, allowing students to explore the full range of economic theory and policy as taught over, the, over time. But for me also, what is really important is that there should be diversity at policy level. Um, the Treasury is uh, dogmatically orthodox, absolutely dogmatically orthodox, and only appoints people who are dogmatically orthodox. And, and the same applies um, to other, um, other really important institutions, like the OBR, uh, like the Institute for Fiscal Studies, but also like the IMF and the World Bank. So the lack of diversity is across the whole spectrum of institutions, and that's a real worry. Um, so I think that's very important. The other thing that I think is important about economics is that there must be a distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics, and both must be taught. Um, we live in a world, I, I, was, I had to address government economists the other day, and there are about 200 of them there, and I put up a a PowerPoint presentation of Jackie Collins' book about the world is full of married men. Wonderful book. <laughs> mean, manipulative, and something else. And I said, and I reproduced them, that the world is full of microeconomists. And the, therefore, the perspective is from a microeconomic perspective. Now, diversity should mean that the, the students should be allowed to see both perspectives. Because the economy in aggregate is very different from the household, the firm, or the individual economy. And believe it or not, the degree to which microeconomists uh, 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 you know, use microeconomic reasoning to arrive at macroeconomic conclusions, i.e., the government's budget is like a household's budget, it must balance or else the world will fall apart. When the government's budget has no resemblance whatsoever to the household budget or to a firm's budget, right? Um, and if we use the, uh, the, the parallel of the household and the firm at some point, we should always point out the huge differences between the two. So the fact that the world is dominated by microeconomists, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies advertised for a new economist on the day I was making my presentation to the government economist. And in it, they said, please come and join this group of microeconomists. Well, I mean, I'm really pleased there's a group of microeconomists looking at, you know, all kinds of uh, data, all kinds of information about the economy. But they can't be looking at the macroeconomy because they're not equipped to do so as microeconomists. So for me, we need diversity, <coughs> diversity across the board. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Alex, I'm going to reverse orders by the way. I'll just go straight. <laughs> Alex, what, what's that to you as an actuary? How do you, what, what do you think that 
where do you want to go for pluralism? In? Can I just say what Anne said? Is you could, you <laughs> could, you could add another spin. I was giving you the actual spin you could use. I, I agree with Anne. No. Um, <laughs> so, from an actual right yeah. <laughs> from, well, a, from an actuarial perspective, one of the things that we study a lot is insurance companies, and I would draw a parallel with insurance companies because there we have what we call a monoline insurer and they will be insurers that do just <coughs> one thing and they might do car insurance or they might do patient insurance and you know when you've got a monoline insurer that is what you've got and some people <coughs> like that because they, the car insurer knows a lot about car insurance if you want exposure to a car insurance company that's the one you go to but then we have things which are not monoline insurers and they have obviously got diversity, and some people like that because car insurance has its ups and downs, the insurance cycle. So does pedestrian insurance, and so does pensions. So actually, if you have lots of different kinds of insurance, then you get lots of different inputs, and they weigh against each other. And actually, some people believe that that's stronger. And to answer your question, uh, I, I see the, the, the pluralism as sort of being the non-monoline insurer. It, if you're taking in thoughts from more than one place then that gives you more diversity and arguably more strength. Uh, and that isn't to say that monoline is necessarily wrong. Now, I think and this is actually where you're going from. As yeah. long as you know yeah. that you are constraining yourself into that box, yeah. nothing wrong with that. No. But it's when you use the box to... You want to get outside that. And I suppose my, personally, one of my real interests in, in this area has come from over the period of my career, we as, as, as actuaries started off um, using, I don't think it's got a proper name, but I'll, I'll call it black box economics, right? Trust me, I'm an actuary. I've done everything in this black box. You guys don't understand it. Just do what I say. Yeah. And that's, that's where the profession was in the 1980s and for most of the 1990s. And then along came uh, a, a few economists as actuaries, interestingly, and introduced financial economics to actuaries and actuaries being quite analytical gravitated towards that and for a while there was a period where we had a little bit of subjectivity a little bit of outward thinking but a pull towards financial economics and more rigor in mathematics and, and, and putting stuff to the market interestingly and this was the meeting that Hermione was at last week we are now seeing that nothing is being listened to apart from financial economics and apart from everything has to be marked to market and yeah. if the market says something different then it, you, know, you must be wrong because the market says this and I fundamentally don't agree with that I've seen that the pendulum swing from ignore the market to the market is always right and actually my personal view is we need to swing it back and actually have a balance of different things coming into the mix and that's one of the reasons that I, I, I really support this, uh, what's being done tonight. Thank you very much, Alex. Leon, the socio-economic viewpoint. So. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the concept, that's interesting, because the concept of socio-economics goes obviously back to Max Weber, who had first a professorship in law, then in economics, and then in sociology. So it all comes from one guy. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, there, um, so what I want to say about... Uh, uh, about uh, pluralist economics is obviously from a bit of an outside perspective. We envy economists for having this box. We don't have it. It sort of falls apart every other day. The box we want to create with our theories and empirical findings. Social reality just doesn't seem to be as tightly uh, sort of uh, working as tightly as, as we want it to. So what I want to say is um, I think what should be a distinguishing characteristic of pluralist economics is to be daring to always go back to foundational questions, mm -hmm. to always go back to the sort of, if you like, first principles, foundational questions of what economics is about. And what I mean by that is both the kind of, if you like, cognitive challenges of actually thinking about the economy, about what, what, I mean, what the basic categories of, of the economy are, if you think about it, scarcity, capital, markets and so forth uh, and obviously on the other side also raising the foundational normative issues that are associated with uh, with economics so I mean I think this um, 
it's obvious that this lends itself to a pluralist approach simply because if you go to these foundational questions, what you will find is, of course, you will need to sort of abandon a lot of the assumptions and axioms that are built into economics and that somehow keep the edifice of current economics together. And I think one of the ways in which to transcend that is to go back to the foundational issues and move beyond these axioms and uh, assumptions of, for instance, rational expectations, uh, market equilibrium, you name it. Uh, and obviously also, if you go back to these foundational issues, what is capital, what, what, is, what are markets, you will actually find that there is not one answer to these questions because yeah. these foundational theoretical issues ultimately nat naturally lead to pluralism, I would say. And they obviously also raise cognitive challenges to us that I think um, require the ability to sort of relate different perspectives to one another. And, and I think that should be sort of a defining characteristic of, of pluralist economics. And in terms of this sort of normative issue, I believe um, that, I mean, it seems clear that economics is at an impasse. I mean, the kind of normative assumptions that sustain economics, they don't hold really anymore, right? The, the idea that, you know, Economics is on the one hand the science of wealth uh, and growth, and on the other, uh, other side the, the science of sort of rational economic behavior and the ways in which these notions have been connected in the idea that growth is good and that rational action sort of sustains growth, they just don't seem to be holding anymore. And so I think that also requires a kind of foundational questioning of what, the, what economics is actually about. And again, I think answering these questions will lead to pluralist answers because that's ultimately what normative debates lead to. Uh, so that's, that's my, my notion of, of pluralism in economics. Brilliant. So now, uh, when I'm, going to, I'm going to do the first three again, then we'll open it. So uh, be, sorry, be patient a bit, and we can come back to things. But uh, if we just... Uh, uh, what I wanted to... Because that was a sort of broad theoretical space, and that's where we wanted to start. But now what I want to do is uh, ask um, uh, the panelists to talk about specific impacts or practical, how <coughs> lack of pluralism or more pluralism actually, in their experience or their research, has actually affected uh, real world outcomes. Uh, uh, because I think it's very important, we can't just think, oh well, theoretically pluralism is, is a good thing. We've got to sort of tie it down and sort of demonstrate to people stories that people can relate to that show how it <coughs> actually makes a difference to real people in the real world. Uh, so, Alex, I was going to... Your, yes. Uh, yeah, but very happy to kick off with, with, with a, a very real-world example. Um, it, it doesn't shine actuaries in a very good light, I'm afraid. Um, it's from the 1990s, and, and I hope that as a profession we've learned a few lessons since then. Uh, and to any of you who have got a pension uh, that was invested with Equitable Life, I apologise now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's going to be a few people in the room. Uh, and um, so it is a bit of a sorry tale. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, with the story, um, huge organisation around for 250 years, very well trusted right up until the end of the 1990s, um, and pretty much run by actuaries. So, you know, put my hand up uh, for, the, for the profession there, my culpa. Um, they were giving what was called a guaranteed annuity rate, and effectively that meant that they were promising uh, an insurance policy based initially on an insurance rate, um, uh, a guaranteed interest rate, of 4% per annum, which these days you might think is a bit high. Um, now, back in the 1980s, they decided that a guaranteed rate of 4% was not enough. So they increased that to 7% guaranteed for the rest of your life. Indeed. Um, and this, to my mind was a decision made by actuary based not on economics or looking at markets or you know, just on knowing that inside the black box that would work out all right. And I really wish that as a profession we had learned then that we need to open our doors and have more people come in and, and, and talk to us and think a bit more widely. But that wasn't what was happening at the time. Now, you can guess the rest. Um, the unbelievably low interest rates of the 1990s meant that they went bust. 
Um, and there was lots of arguments about whether they should have gone bust or not, or whether they should have carried on, because interest rates would bounce back from that low rate <laughs> of the 1990s. Now, of course, we've got an extra 20 years of hindsight, so, you know, they were always going to go down. And uh, so to answer your question, Henry, um, I think the reason why it matters is because people will make different decisions if they think much more widely, and that is one absolutely catastrophic example, affecting people in the room, that where different decision would have been made if people hadn't had been so closed-minded and just saying, we know the answer, we've got the little box, and we're just thinking in this one monoline platform. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to barge in there, but my point is also going to be about interest <laughs> rates, so I just ah. think it would be a neat follow-up. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I think that's a really... That, my brother-in-law lost a lot of money from five, so I, I <coughs> and caused a great deal of pain. But um, I think it's a really powerful example, and I, I want to use that because I was going to say where the theoretical thing falls down is it, it, it can, it can, the consequences can be catastrophic. So in orthodox economics, the rate of interest is a result of market forces, the supply and demand for money, mm. right? That's the implication, therefore, is that money is like a commodity. And if there's a lot of demand for it, the price of it goes up. If demand falls, the price goes down. Well, A, money is not a commodity. And economists still struggle. Main profession, mainstream economists still struggle with the idea that money has no, no connection to a commodity at all. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. It's a social construct. It's a promise to pay. Uh, as, um, as, as has been known and understood for, for many hundreds of years. It's nothing more than a promise to pay based on trust. Right? Anyway, that's, that's money and the problem of money. But economists treat interest rates as something that just is the result of market forces. Right? Whereas actually in, interest rates are always set and fixed by people, people, real people. And why this matters is also because on the one hand, Keynes was passionate about the need for interest rates to be low. Because he argued that on average, over time, businesses make profits of about 3% a year. Over time, over history, right? If interest rates are higher than 3%, they go bust. Fundamentally, they can't pay their debts, right? So he argued very passionately in the general theory that rates of interest should be kept low. Orthodox economists say, no, 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 you don't have to worry about that. The market can decide what the rate of interest should be. So the, when the market decides that the rate of interest should go up, as is happening right now, right now the market is putting immense pressure on the governor of the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates, right? But in the meantime, the market has burdened billions of people in billions of dollars of debt. We have, a, we have levels of debt that now exceed the level of debt post-crisis. The minute interest rates, even the idea of interest rates going up, the shivers begin. People begin to get, and we've seen that because when the new governor of the Federal Reserve arrived at the Fed, um, his name is Jerome, this gets him for the moment, he, um, he said he was going to put up interest rates straight away. He did on the first day, he, he hiked them up, up by a little, nudged them up slightly. But at his second meeting, he said, mm -hmm data coming in don't look so good and he's pulled back from it. You read the Financial Times today, you read stories about how much pressure he's under to increase rates further. That has an, a catastrophic effect. Anyway, so, so what we know is that a committee of men and possibly one or two women in the Federal Reserve will decide on whether interest rates rise because it has nothing to do with the market. That may affect the market in other ways. But what we also know is, and what we discovered at the height of the financial crisis, was that there was something called the London Interbank Offer Rate, which everybody thought was a rate determined by the market. Right? It was something abstract that just happened to go up and down depending on the demand for money. And then we discovered that there were people in the back rooms of banks manipulating that rate and pretending they were pretending that they paid a lower rate on their debt than they actually paid because they wanted to show how creditworthy they were that they had low interest debt. So they manipulated it down and they paid each other to do the manipulation. Now I remember when that was discovered because it was, it was, it was the Wall Street Journal that began to say, excuse me, 
there's sixteen trillion dollars of debt left on this rate of interest rate. Why is it moving around in the way that it's moving around? And this is post crisis. Now, the banks here were managed by a cartel called the British Banking Association, right? And they were fixing this rate under the under the radar and pretending that it was all to do with the market. The Wall Street Journal, because most American mortgages are linked to this rate, began to say, hey, there's something really funny going on. And it mattered a lot to people paying mortgages or companies with outstanding debts, right? It, it mattered enormously. And these guys were manipulating. So what that proves to us is that the rate of interest is not determined by something called the invisible hand. It's determined by individual people. Every bank uh, has uh, within, within it uh, a, a, an assessor, someone who looks at you when you apply for a loan and assesses whether or not you're a sound bet. If you're a pole dancer in Florida, does everyone, has everyone seen the big short? <laughs> that wonderful cookie in the big short who's swinging around in a, on a pole and you know, half naked and the guy from Wall Street says to her, have you got a mortgage? She says, well, of course I've got a mortgage. He says, I don't have to find that. <laughs> <laughs> she says, You know what I mean? My sister. And have you, and is it at a variable rate? And she says, Yes, of course it's at a variable rate. And then she says, And by the way, I've got five mortgages. <laughs> Why? She was so risky. Goldman Sachs, or whoever it was that lent the money to her, could charge her 15%. She said, I don't care about paying 15%, I pay 15%, because I desperately want to get five apartments, because I know if I have five apartments, I mean, I have money till the end of time. So she, this woman was living on tips in, in, in a nightclub, right? And Goldman Sachs was lending her money at very high rates of interest, because she was extraordinarily profitable as, a, as an investment compared to lending it to some clever professor who had loads of assets to back up and so on. Anyway, so this is what happens. In, so every single loan is agreed on a person-to-person -person basis or a person-to-firm basis or a person-to-government basis and so on. Um, and so we've learned that the economists really don't understand this, this thing, this most important <coughs> instrument in, in the economy called the rate of interest. And right now they're saying they're begging for the Federal Reserve to put interest rates up. That's going to be catastrophic, in my view. This is when the next crisis begins. The question is, when does it begin? And, and just to remind you that when Greenspan was governor of the Federal Reserve, he was saying, oh, this is the great moderation, everything is going hunky-dory, I don't have to do anything, the market will fix it all. Then suddenly comes the dot-com crash. So what does he do? He reacts by lowering Federal Reserve rates dramatically, right? And that increases, so everybody gets over the dot-com crash and says, oh, rates are terribly low, and they borrow crazy money, and they go out and borrow crazy money. So gradually, he begins to increase the rate, ratchet it up at every meeting, slowly, 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 until the rate of interest becomes a dagger pointed at a vast bubble of global debt and blows it up, blows it up in 2007-9. For me, the cause of the crisis was not the housing bubble. The housing bubble was a symptom of excessive credit creation at high real rates of interest. Right? And now we're watching this happen again. We're sitting watching this happen in real life again as there's been crazy lending go on since interest rates have been so low and now the Fed is threatening to put up rates. And so is the Bank of England, although the Bank of England clawed back and is now known as the unreliable boyfriend. <laughs> so, so you know, but 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 nevertheless, the, the Bank of England will follow the Fed at some point, and it's going to affect every single one of us that has a mortgage, and it's going to affect all of those that have borrowed money to go to university and have got these huge debts, for example. It's going to affect you know almost every household and every firm, and um, eco economists are saying nothing to do with us, Gov. You know, it's it's the invisible hand. Anyway, sorry to rant about that, but it but links directly to that story. And Leon, it's a great story. I, I'm, I'm just uh, 
so I'm sure, maybe because I'm German, whether it's good to keep interest rates low and sort of expanding, ah, ex <laughs> expanding uh, the sort of... Uh, you have to read Keynes. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think we have a we have the problem that monetary policy was too easy and there's too much of uh, debt. Yes, uh, too much of debt. Exactly. Is that is an <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> maybe. Okay. okay. It should not be fixed by, by interest rates. It should be fixed by regulating credit. That's all we should be doing. We shouldn't be allow that to become what it's become. Anyway, that's okay. It. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I got maybe three things to say. So I, first, I think uh, pluralism is needed because, according to my understanding, it facilitates exactly what I said before. It facilitates the kind of intellectual development of students, but also the intellectual curiosity and creativity in, in academia that we need, uh, exactly for addressing these foundational issues that I have been mentioning uh, earlier, and I guess pluralism is the right way to sort of, uh, because obviously if people, if students, uh, PhD students in economics are desperate to find the problem that they are supposed to spend eight years or uh, seven years on with their PhD, and they just need to wait for the professor to tell them what their problem is, obviously this is not exactly what we want in terms of, sort of fostering uh, thinking and curiosity in, in, in academia. Secondly, uh, I guess the, the reason we need it is because incremental innovation in economics has sort of, as I said, reached an impasse, right? You can maybe include financial frictions into uh, general stochastic equilibrium models, but I mean, they remain high on, based on highly questionable assumptions. And so I wonder whether you can sort of, through incremental innovation, solve some of the foundational problems of economics. And I think pluralism is an alternative to this idea that, you know, you just need to tweak there a little bit and then, uh, then you have a better, uh, proper model of the economy, for instance, post-crisis. Uh, thirdly, and this is maybe what my example relates to, uh, people being educated in a pluralist way are possibly better equipped for dealing with cognitive dissonance uh, and also with translating the knowledge uh, that's generated through experience into, if you like, valid observations that might have a policy impact, right? How you, do you translate actual observations or what happens in the economy into a kind of valid statement that can lead to uh, consequences? And my example is, is a kind of very obvious one, which is uh, the, the way the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England reacted in the September 2007. Um, if you look at the transcripts of this meeting, which were published, uh, um, you, sh you see that actually these experts, because the Monetary Policy Committee is, an ex is a body of experts with usually PhDs in economics, usually from the London School of Economics, um, <laughs> You see that they recognized what they called at that point dislocations in the markets. So they observed in September 2007, they observed things going wrong in the, particularly the international money markets in the international financial system. Uh, they didn't know about Northern Rock because Merlin King didn't tell them, uh, <laughs> but they observed the more general effects of uh, liquidity crisis arriving uh, in, in the financial system. But it's interesting how they dealt with this. Um, so they observed these problems in the markets, but then they came to the uh, view, and I just read from the transcripts, eventually market participants should be able to reevaluate the risks involved. Once these processes are complete, the demand for additional liquidity should fall back. That's what they assumed in September 2007. Um, so for me, this is a case of sort of rationalizing away cognitive dissonance, something that didn't fit their understanding of rational markets, and also something that didn't fit really what they thought was important, namely uh, stabilizing the rate of consumer price inflation uh, in the economy, uh, and they weren't able to really sort of shift maybe perspective and uh, focus on financial market problems. And as you, as you might know, it, Mervyn King, it took, it took a whole year, it took till October uh, 2008, so Mervyn King accepted that, you know, the Bank of England was essential for addressing these dislocations in the money markets that had already been, been evident in September 2007. So that's a long period for somebody coming to terms with, uh, with, with the crisis. 
Uh, and obviously it's not a personal thing of Merlin King. It has to do with the ways in which he himself, but his colleagues as well, were trained and the way they thought about the economy and the ways in which they couldn't also deal with knowledge that was to provide it to them. Because obviously in the Bank of England there were people who knew what, was, what, what the risks were, uh, but this knowledge was not uh, legitimate in the context of uh, monetary policy formulation. So um, that's, that's a classic case of, of a lack of pluralism leading to a particular way of rationalizing away cognitive dissonance. And I would say this is a negative, if you like, the, the negative case of why uh, pluralism would be needed uh, as, a, as, a, as a response to that problem. I think that's uh, it's interesting you use the term legitimization because actually you can have lots of pluralism, but if most of the people in most of the camps are totally ignored, yeah, exactly, it's a waste of time. Exactly, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, they they just think as they're, they're a load of loonies. We don't listen to them. Yeah. This is the answer. Yeah, and so yeah, so I think the fact that legitimization of different perspectives and people yeah. listening to each other and respecting each other, yeah, is crucial, isn't it? Because I mean, I, I did an interview with Rachel Lomax, who was also in that committee. And uh, she said, yeah, there was a, she is, she is not, like, she was a treasury, treasury official and was more broadly educated as a lot of British public elites are, right? They have a degree from Oxford in politics, philosophy and economics or history or whatever. A lot of the elites are not, not trained just in economics. Uh, but uh, this was not a legitimate, I mean, she, she wasn't able to challenge what the more sort of hardcore economists with the forecasts, what they were telling her. And so afterwards she said, maybe, maybe we should have had a broader discussion, but she wasn't able to raise that in the meeting uh, where, I mean, as you say, you have to express legitimate positions to be influencing policy. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge. And, yeah. So... Um and we'll do this quite quickly and then open the floor. We got to late 30, so we've still got three quarters of an hour. Uh, in one minute, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> what do we have? Do the questions? No, it's fine. It's just, just, uh, yeah. What do you think, Anne? I mean, what's your sort of short, if you were bumped into uh, um, Theresa? No, he must be. Mm -hmm. wanting your advice, I'm sure. Uh, and we had one minute in the, uh, in the lift uh, uh, going up, and she said, oh, Anne, how lovely to see you. What do you think we should do about this pluralism thing? Well, I would say give them a platform, give alternative or different economists a platform. The, the key thing is that the, the point of view, the alternative point of view, for example, an interest rate, is not heard. It's, there isn't a platform for it at universities or in the newspapers or in you know, big magazines. Uh, or in the big policy places. So it's about platforming alternative views and allowing that to happen. And I don't know if, as Prime Minister, she can do that. But she should certainly say she would, would like to see it happen. She would like to see more diverse views. I think she probably can do very little. I mean, I think it's a, huge, it's a huge <laughs> ideological and, and propaganda issue, really. And it's a question of how we deal with this ideology which is so pervasive across the board, across Europe, across the United States. And for me, the only thing that will bring economists to their senses is another financial crisis. And that's horrifying to me, because the next crisis is going to be more severe. And there will be fewer economic tools available for dealing with it. And the people who are going to be hurt will not be the people who are the architects of the crisis. So I fear that that's the only way society can end. The really wonderful thing is that since the last, since 2007-9, you know, there's all of you guys, there's all of this happening. You know, there's, and, and I'm part of a, a whole range of activities, rethinking economics, all of the wonderful things that are going, because the public asked the question, what the hell went on? What happened? And the public has lost confidence in economists. And, you know, but not enough to shift them yet. But another crisis, I think, would definitely be that the trouble is another crisis will bring about a, a kind of reaction which is so ugly and so awful, which is what we're already witnessing. We're witnessing this resistance, this rise of, that's called populism, but I think it's right-wing nationalism, which is protectionist, which says, please protect me from these market forces. 
that I have no control over. Build a wall between us and Mexico. Build a wall between us and China. Build a wall between us and Europe. Please look after me. Protect me. That's a, a natural instinct for people who've been hammered by a crisis. But it, it, it can take a very ugly form. And I, you know, that's why I, I, I'm pretty pessimistic. Pessimistic. So I think, as I understand, your model is a bit like how to deal with a, a, a drug addict. They have to get to such a bad place <laughs> before they ever change. And you always have to wait till they're on their knees before they'll ever give up drugs, sort of cold turkey. Or, uh, and that would be the, the way things happen. Uh, Leon, then, uh, um. Oh, I can be very short. I think we should give more resources to Henry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they'll, they'll, they'll do some, that'll some part. That'll everything. Yeah, not, not everything. But I think it's important. Step. I, think, I, think you are, I think you have a very good approach with, with uh, promoting pluralist uh, economics. I think what's, what's, what's very good is exactly what, what, what Anne said about sort of promoting uh, or establishing a platform that allows for pluralism yeah. to be strengthened and to be visible. And I think you do that very well with, uh, with the initiative you just uh, started about building a kind of interdisciplinary network, first maybe in London, then more broadly with researchers that have a, have a genuine interest in understanding the economy from various points of view, sort of engaging with one another. And with Mint Magazine, I think that's, that's a perf I mean, I mean, it's a very good way of showcasing uh, pluralism. And I th also think that the same thing applies to the accredi accreditation scheme yes. that, uh, that, that uh, you've started. I think, first I didn't entirely understand why you started with this, but now I'm entirely convinced that it's about accrediting pluralist courses and both in economics proper, but also maybe something that, that I convene, which is more at the boundaries of economics uh, and sharing expertise across these uh, curricula across these courses and then also again making them more visible maybe creating a, a platform where they can become more visible I think that's that's important I mean I think that's sort of strengthening I think there is also a whole power game within economics about who gets the powerful positions and so forth and fighting internally about resources uh, within the funding bodies and so forth but I'm not since I'm not an economist, I'm not into that game, and so I really like your approach of first strength, strengthening the pluralist, uh, the pluralist uh, sort of approach to economics, uh, uh, and then see what what comes out of it. Also, in terms of substantive insights on important issues like um, the financial crisis, the next crisis. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I didn't pay him for that, by the way. I was an <laughs> independent voice from a senior academic in LSE. <laughs> just, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what? Sure. Um, well, Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon in the world for changing the world. And I totally concur with that. I, you know, I think this is kind of what Adam Leon has just been saying. And, what would you teach people in education? Well, I think conventional economics gives you a model. It gives you an answer. And people really like that. And I think that's part of what we're talking about is why is it that people l l link into that and just say, oh, I've got an answer. And the economists, they're really bright. They've got PhDs. That answer must be right. Yeah. And if you come along with another answer and you say, well, what about this answer? Well, one of those answers must be wrong. And the education that I would give is, no, 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 both of those answers are wrong. The truth will lie somewhere out there, and they are both just shots at a dartboard. And don't have this false vision of, that's the right answer, it must be right. Actually, the world is a lot more messy and uncertain than that. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really tough message to get out there. People like certainty. People are lazy. They like certainty. We need to educate people that the world is nothing like as straightforward as you think it's going to be. Interest rates are not going to be 7% forever. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a tough message to have told people in the 1990s, but we know it's true. And therefore, education and, yes, yeah, the, the stuff that we're doing here tonight um, has to be very much part of the answer. And, and more strength to your elbow. Thank you, Alex. Well, uh, now, oh, we have a... Right. Now, there is a rule. We're going to go for a rule that... Uh, is the um, 
uh, but Jeff Mulligan, I'm not Jeff Mulligan, uh, who was it that said, I forget, but the, the apparently there's some evidence to say that if the first person asks the question is a woman, yeah. the discussion goes much better. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I'm told this, uh, whether it's true or not is neither here nor there. So, but, um, <laughs> but we will, we'll, we'll start, uh, uh, if, if, I'm not sort of forcing this, uh, and, and there are few women in the room, so, but thank you, Valerie, I was relying on you. <laughs> uh, if you say who you are, then we'll... Um. Um, Valerie, I'm a member of um, PEP. Um, I wondered what you thought about some of the responses from the economics profession itself. For example, Wendy Carlin and the, the CORE sort of yeah. revamp of their whole curriculum made available online, sort of multidisciplinary aspects and so on. Do you think that's... Uh, going in the right direction, or or not? Well, Are we going to take some more questions? Well, we could take some more. Okay, we'll take that. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, what Alex was saying, Rethinking Economics did an interesting analysis of the exam questions in the economics courses, and 80% of the answers were regurgitation, and there was a right answer. And the 20% that weren't were in the optional subjects. But I have a question for Anne. Anne. Um, Look, like, if microeconomics doesn't inform macroeconomics, what's it good for? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Anne. Yeah, I, I just want to, um, on the subject of pluralism, I just want to offer a slightly different point of view and then ask for a response, which is that there's been a lot of talk about economics as, as an orthodox approach, and then we haven't heard from these other voices, and therefore we should encourage people to be aware of these other voices. But if you think about the black box, I like the black box analogy and the idea that there's this black box and we're not allowed to see into the black box. And to me that's far more important than teaching what's outside the black box to the people who are familiar with what's in the black box, if you see what I mean. And so it, rather than teaching other ideas in economics, we should be teaching the basic ideas of economics to lots of other people who don't know anything about it. It's the same thing. It's actually the same thing. Because what, it's a, what you want to do is, as a mathematician, if you're, if you're working on a problem, you spend five days trying to prove something, and then you spend another five days trying to prove you're wrong. Right? And that's how rigor, that's how rigor emerges. Mm. But if you do that collaboratively, that means you need people thinking about economics who are not, don't even understand, what, have a clue what's in this black box at the moment. So to get that idea out there, you actually need to teach that very, very well in a, in a condensed way to the essence of the orthodox view to people who have no idea about it. And then you will get your rigour and you will get your progress. Because if you teach that to, say, biologists and chemists and physicists, you'll get far more progress, I think. Well, that's, uh, that's an issue. We've got, we'll do three, and now we've had three, so well, because uh, we don't want to overtax. Mm -hmm. I've already quite forgotten which one <laughs> before. Uh, but, Barry, you wanted to, uh, sort of, the, the, the core program. Um, and I don't know who, uh, if we take an answer, that, who knows? Probably, Anne, you know more than most, do you? Or, or? Um, to be honest, I'm not an academic, but I don't teach uh, you. Know, do you know? So oh, 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 oh. Do you know the yeah. core program? No, you know most about it. I uh, think you uh, should uh, Okay. <laughs> Because I know there was a discussion on this. Yes, I have the, um, yes, I've had discussions about the, the core program. Uh, and actually, if you, if you raise questions about it, the first thing you're asked, have you read it all? And, and actually, the truth is there's a hell of a lot of it. Of it. Uh, and so uh, there probably aren't that many people who've been through the whole lot in terms of being able to give a, a, a sort of a, an overarching. But there are a number of academics who have looked at it. Um, uh, I've looked at bits of it. And the conclusion was that, I mean, on the positive, it is much more engaging. It does link to real-world issues, inequality, uh, um, uh, the, the, the sort of dynamics, the instability, all that sort of thing. So it starts from a good place. It uses a lot of history of data of what's really happened. So it, it has a sort of historical perspective. But where I think it falls down is that when it then tries to explain it, uh, it reverts back to very standard ideas of preferences, uh, rational expectations, rational uh, economic calculus, all, and, and uh, optimization and equilibrium. So it stays in that spot. And I looked at one bit of it, which was the section on institutions, uh, which is quite interesting because actually most economics textbooks or whatever, you would not find a chapter or, or a section on yeah. institutions. They yeah. just not, um, not address them or think of them at all. Um, and I um, 
Firstly, the discussion of institutions was all about preferences and equilibria within institutional dynamics. And then I looked at the reading list. Uh, I looked particularly for the, the leading uh, um, institutional economist in the UK, uh, one Geoffrey Hodgson, um, who's actually at, uh, at Herefordshire University. I'm sort of Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire, sorry, Hertfordshire University, which says something in itself. Um, and he was not in the reading list. And, and I asked Wendy, I said, oh, that's strange. You know, he's, the leading, he's our leading international institutional economist, and this is your section on institution. Why is, he not in the, why is he not in the reading list? And she said, yes, I've looked at him. He's very difficult, and uh, I think the students would find him far too difficult to read. Uh, now, apart from the fact that actually he's not that difficult, um, and I did philosophy, come on. Difficult, you know, uh, and so the poor economic students are not yeah. up to reading texts that are a little bit complicated and too, you know, they, they can't, you know, that's the sort of assumption. Um, the other thing they actually, we are, we've, they've always been attacked for lack of pluralism. Um, and recently, uh, Sam Bowles and Wendy uh, uh, Carlin wrote an article uh, on trying to defend this, and they came up with the term pluralism by integration. They because we are very busy and students are very busy, for our benefit, have looked around all the different schools of economics and picked the bits that they think make sense and turned it into one integrated answer, which is how textbooks, economics textbooks, always worked, really. They, they picked and choose the bits they want and, you know, like they reconfigured uh, 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 Keynes, etc., into a, something that was safe and came up with one answer so they could keep on training it. So it's the same, it lacks pluralism in that it only gives one answer at the end of the day. And it doesn't, they, they attack pluralism as a, they call it a tournament. We, we're not going to have this tournament of different ways of thinking. Which was sort of interesting, consider they, they really like markets, and I think tournament is a bit like a competition, <laughs> isn't it? Um, uh, but, you know, but they didn't want a tournament of different ways of thinking. So they are very clear. I mean, to start with, they said they're not pluralist, and then they said they were pluralist by integration because they realised that not being pluralist was a problem. Uh, but pluralist by integration seems a bit like an oxymoron to me. So, uh, and it's very, this is quite a touchy issue because a lot of the funders who fund Rethinking Economics and might fund us also fund core, uh, so and don't and sort of are quite defensive of it. So, um, yeah. Can I ask sort of a second question? I think. Sorry. Just p p picking up on where you're coming from, with I think uh, particularly in, in this world where we do exams, from what you're saying, there has to be a right answer to an exam, right? Um, and uh, as actuaries, that is the early exams that we do. There is always a right answer, but then actually. I think our profession has got it right because you get onto the higher level exams, the end to qualify as a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries uh, or a Chartered Actuary as well. You get exams where there is no right answer and um, a lot of regulators think there is a right answer. Our regulator is the Institute of Actuaries. <coughs> they don't think there's a right answer. And I think we need more regulators and more exam systems that are prepared to accept there is no right answer to this question. Yeah. We're just going to set this question and, and run off and use your brain and think about this yeah, and work out what's going on. Yeah. 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 What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. And was it, there was another angle to. I, I actually like to uh, uh, respond, not answer, but respond to the <laughs> proposal about spreading. I mean, th I think there is a cartoon about economics, like more sort of standard economics that tries to popularize. And I think the Bank of England is very sort of active in that area too, going to schools and teaching economics more broadly in, 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 in the public. So I think generally this is, this is interesting. I don't think you will get to a critique of the foundational axioms and assumptions of economics by spreading it to more people. I think ultimately, as I mean, that's my, my view. University, this is, a, this is a world where people participate because they want to and because they have themselves something that you know, that motivates them to do it. And so I think it's more about sort of offering that possibility to people who actually have a stake in, in these things. Uh, I think sort of popularizing economics m might lead even to more dogmatism and I don't know. It just, I don't think that will sort of lead to a more critical understanding of economics. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But maybe I didn't understand uh, your proposal entirely. No, no, I, I, um, I can see it. It all depends how you do it. I mean, you're talking about an accreditation system. If you do something badly, 
then there's bad results, but it's all to do with the quality. So yeah. I wasn't saying an uncritical, watered down, popular view of orthodox economics. I was saying more like, say, some of the things that Steve Keen does is he, he lifts the lid on this black box. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what you need to do also is understand some of the some of the key drivers, like if you look at complexity science and yeah. Santa Fe, you look at these physicists coming along and trying to redo economics in like a, a weekend, yeah. right? Yeah. Which, <laughs> sit down, Mr. McConnell, you explain to us, we're very good at math, yeah. don't worry, we can cope, and then we're going to sort it all out for you. Yeah. It didn't work that way. And the reason is that some of the core things that economists struggle with, the complexity yeah. of, of, of life, yeah. they have a very sort of efficient way of of dealing with that, yeah. right? It's not intuitive. So if you look at, for example, I work in, in IT yeah. and data science, if you look at something like security systems, yeah. when, a, when an IT person designs a security system to, um, to, 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 to defend this, this, this IT infrastructure, say a business, then they design all these different systems, right, to, to, to defend it. And, and they also include passwords and things like that, and they have different levels of encryption and all this stuff you can design. You spend loads of money on this. And what they realized after many years is it doesn't work unless you understand incentives. Because if you don't understand how annoying it is to remember a stupid, complicated <laughs> password, you have no idea how little effort people <coughs> put in to making that a difficult password, right? This isn't intuitive to an engineer. It's not intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> this is all about incentives, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but when you start using those ideas productively in the workplace, if you actually use them, because no one uses them in, in no one uses these ideas, yeah. right, outside of economics. But if you actually start using them, then new things will develop, right, that combine different problems that none of the economists work on. They don't yeah. work on real problems. They work on this abstract thing, yeah. right, which has okay. this one intellectual yeah. trick, which is very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, okay. just, just as a comment, Ma economists mm -hmm. have realized this themselves. I mean, they go into market design more and more, and that is part of maybe You're also of the problem, problem because they design the, w the world yeah, that they think should exist. But anyway, okay, <laughs> we will. Uh, ooh, there's lots of hands going up. Uh, um, so, well, I'll go sort of that way around the, the room, so which gets you, Paul. But uh, we'll have to. We'll have to be quite um, uh, specific in there. Yeah, perfect. Go. I. I um, very well cut in the point uh, of what is economics for? Uh, because where I sit um, and the people I work with are the poorest. And unless the economics provides uh, an adequate minimum income and an affordable <coughs> home uh, that for anybody um, on the, throughout the country, um, it's failing. And it is undoubtedly failing at the moment. Uh, there are, there are, except in one interesting and particular way, uh, which was that I had a hand in commissioning the research which became the London Living Wage. And the employers found that the living wage meant uh, that they got better cleaning, that it was more efficient, that there wasn't so much turnover, that people weren't <coughs> very sick so often. And they, on the whole, having a, an adequate minimum income was, was good for business. Mm. And uh, at the moment, it's voluntary. And, and of course, um, uh, 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 Osborne's living wage has actually nothing to do with researching the minimum income need for But this, this came from pluralism of different voices, your voices yeah. coming in and countervailing. Well, I, 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 no, I'm simply saying, and it, it, what sort of pluralism has got to be about? is putting the bundle together so well that you've got, uh, at the bottom run, the ethical question is answered, are we going to feed everybody properly, are we going to give them homes? Okay, great, we'll take that as we'll a comment, I think, and uh, yeah. then we'll disagree with that. As a naive non-economist, I was surprised how much the comments have been very financial, very economic orientated. I thought um, tourism would go way beyond that. It would include sociology, it would include psychology, uh, politics, um, the media, etc. Have I got that wrong? Maybe yeah. can I very quickly answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. No, we'll, we'll take one more, Tim, and then we'll... Uh, I think my question, I should follow one quite nicely from that. So. 
Um, so I do research on transition to, to socially and ecologically sustainable systems. And from my perspective, you know, economic questions are very central to that. So we need a wider range of economic theories to, to, to address those social and ecological challenges. But some of my colleagues would argue that what we need are more sociological or political or other approaches to understanding these, these questions. So, you know, paraphrasing, they would say we need less economics rather than more economics. So I wonder how the, the panel would, would respond to that. Okay, well, let's take that, you know, how wide should we go? And, and are, we're, are we being a bit narrow on the... On the panel. On, mm. on the panel. Oh, that's... Mm. But okay. you're a sociologist, we'll give you... I mean, I, I was just supposed to say that I think uh, the, the criticism is important, but in terms of Henry's initiative or the PEP more generally, I think that's one of the more open attempts to change economics, precisely to be defining pluralism in an interdisciplinary fashion and defining it in terms of, as he said, in terms of addressing real world problems, problems of inclusiveness, of uh, sustainability, uh, inequality, um, and in terms of pluralism, in terms of theoretical approaches that can come from core economics, but also outside of that, um, including maybe natural sciences, even though I'm, as a sociologist, I'm still inclined to think that economics is a social science, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, I want to say, first of all, in answer to the very important question, what is economics for? I think what we also have to face is that economics is driven by class interests. Right? In fact, the form of economics that we have now, the dominant economics, serves the interests of the 1%. Yeah. No question asked. They don't, the economists don't believe that they're class-driven. They think they're being independent and objective and scientific. But in reality, the outcome is to serve the 1% and to, re to hell with the rest, basically. So for me, there has to be a recognition of the nature of class and its influence on the economics profession and the acceptance that the economics profession is actually uh, promoting the interest of a very small yeah. group. Um, and when we do that, we unpack quite a lot of what's happening in economics. And I agree with you, I think it's outrageous, that you know, volunteers like yourselves had to come up with this idea, or this uh, a non-economist non and non-governmental bodies came up with the idea of a living wage, pushed it through, and it's now only adopted on a voluntary basis. The government stays far away from it. And that, for me, is, is terribly telling. Um, so what is economics for? And I, can I just say in answer to Tim that I absolutely agree with you. The problem with economics is its very narrowness. And the fact that it, it fails to understand the role of the climate in economics, and the fact that resources are finite, you know, I, I, I'm so annoyed by this debate about robotification and how we're going to, you know, there'll be no jobs in the future because we're going to just have robots and machines do everything, as if we have an, un, an infinite supply of, you know, iron and steel and all of the things that go into making robots, but in particular that we have an infinite supply of something called the rare earths, you know, which are found mainly in the Congo, and are dug up at great expense to the people of the Congo. The fact is, these are finite in their supply. And, and the fact that the economists cannot understand that the, the important inputs into the economy are finite it seems to me to be a huge, huge um, problem for economists. So I am very much with you that it should be broadened into and include history, for example, the history of economics. It haven't been taught for a very long time. People, have, economists think that his, the history of economics is not important. But um, I want to say, someone complained about too much talk about finance and not enough about these other <laughs> subjects. I want to say that, for example, uh, finance plays a very big part in the impact on the ecosystem. So if, if you have a, a, an economic system that says credit creation should be something subject to, to the invisible hand, that the, that the society and the government should have no role in determining whether or not too much credit or debt is created. We should leave that to something else. Well, what we've done is to leave it to a globalized financial sector, which now lends crazy money at very high rates of interest to people who won't repay in the end, and that will be catastrophic. But the really important thing is this. 
If I take out a loan at a certain rate of interest, 3, 5, 7%, I have to extract assets from the earth and from labor to repay that loan. So the Brazilians have to strip their forests to repay their debts, right? If you think about that, think about it in that way, you realize there is a powerful connection between finance and the ecosystem. If we manage the financial system, and in particular credit and the rate of interest, we could manage the use of ecosystem, eco, eco, ecological assets. But because we, we, there's such a divide between you know, the, the uh, ecological uh, profession and the economics profession, and we're in these different boxes, we don't see the connection. But I, my mission is to persuade mm -hmm. green economists to understand the impact of the financial system on the ecosystem. And once you do that, then you begin to understand that you can't change things inside you know, the ecosystem until you change the financial system. So I apologize for all this talk about finance, but it is pretty fundamental. Because it's not just exploiting the Earth's assets, it's of course exploiting the people, the poorest people in particular. It's exploiting labor. We've done away with trade unions. We now have what Joan Robinson called monopsony, which is that employers dictate wages and, and workers have no rights effectively and no power. This is now well understood by all the economists last week had an article saying, please, can we have stronger trade unions? I find that absolutely <laughs> But the economist is beginning to understand if you strip people of income, they don't go shopping. Surprise, surprise. You know? If you strip people of income, they don't pay their debts. Surprise, surprise, you know. If you strip people of income, they get, get mad as hell and they begin to rebel. The economists are now beginning to panic. It's a bit too late. We've destroyed the unions, we've destroyed the rent, we've lowered wages, we've lowered income. We're determined to have deflationary policies which lower the rate the, 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 the income in the economy. We're determined that's really essential. And and we're already facing the cuts. So the economists are now saying, please can we have corporate trade unions No. But can I say just one other thing, which is that as someone who I believe that I'm you know I'm very committed to, to a more sustainable uh, life support system for both us and the rest of the of rest of nature. That actually we're gonna to have to move from an, an economy which is dominated by um, which is labor intensive. We're going to have to substitute labor for carbon. You know, at the moment we think we can fly green beans from Kenya to consume here. We're going to have to stop flying green beans from Kenya to London. We're going to have to grow our own green beans. And that's going to require a transformation of the economy towards something that's more labor intensive and work intensive. But the resistance to that, of course, is enormous. Alex, I'll be like brief. Um, two, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I apologise for not being brief. One thing, <laughs> one thing that's slightly depressing, apologise in advance, one thing that's hopefully a bit more uplifting. Um, to start with, with the point here, I, to, to my mind, you can't separate economics from politics. The two are naturally entwined, I'm afraid. Uh, and actually, I would like to put philosophy in there as well. And we've already had a mention of PPE, um, which is um, the version of economics at Oxford University, which I'm quite a fan of, actually, because that does throw them all into one pot together and maybe start to have a little bit of wider thinking um, around economics. The thing that is, is, is very sad, but I'm, I'm going to share it with you guys anyway, you, um, we as actuaries look at how long people are living, and there's a general knowledge out there that people are living longer, and that that's reversed recently, and people are living shorter, for which of those is true. And the answer is, of course, they are both true, I'm afraid. The truth is, because of rising inequality in the United Kingdom, we are seeing that the poorest people are definitely living noticeably shorter, you know, incredibly. And they die. No, sorry, <laughs> middle, they die early. Yeah, they die. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, so there and is an unprecedented absolutely. rise in infant death yeah. uh, in 1516. Indeed. And uh, the, the, the richest... Uh, 10, 20% are living a lot longer. In fact, uh, enjoying the same in improvements in longevity that we have seen for the last 20 or 30 years. Absolutely incredible coming out of the data, very, very tangibly. Which is a, a sad note. So I won't finish on that one. I'll come back to something a bit more uplifting, which I think is relevant to questions two or three, which were, is about, to, to me, all, all of these non-financial things, um, not wanting to dismiss them and put them in one bucket, but really they do glue together where markets don't work. Uh, environmental, social and governance areas. 
Um, and what I'm seeing ad advising a multi-billion pound pension funds is that ESG issues really are getting on the agenda now and the asset owners are finally starting to say, do you know what, we should be paying attention to these areas where the market doesn't work, where we should be thinking longer term than just what are the financial returns next quarter or next year, but actually investing in a way that's got a time horizon, which is 10 years or 20 years, which is, I think, quite uplifting that that has changed. I've been campaigning for that for the last 10 years, more, um, and we're finally getting some traction. Oh, it's my mind, I mean, this could, that could be a whole section for an hour and a half, <laughs> all by itself. Just We're that. covering a, a broad, uh, broad territory here, but well, uh, yes, in front. Yeah, I've got, um, I, I want you guys to tell me um, that I'm wrong here, but from what I, the little I do know, I've, we never really had economic pluralism, because after the Second World War, it was Keynesianism, and there wasn't any other ideas really going. So the Tories and Labour both <coughs> agreed on this kind of way of running things, the ruling elite, the 1%, as you talk about, they had this idea, um, which I think is a consciousness that comes from loads of ordinary people dying in two wars, and um, that kind of sense that, you know, their blood is red as ours is red. And I just, I just see that, you know, it's been such a long time, you know, we haven't had any pluralism. It's, as far as I know, it's like 70 years. So why would there be ever any pluralism? Because Marx and Engels always talk about the ruling ideas belong to the ruling elite. So it will always be their ideas that exist. And all you can do is just get rid of the new ruling elite and put, say, what Anne's ideas are. If you wanted Anne's ideas to rule, we'd have to get rid of that ruling elite. And well, Anne, Anne, Anne is the leader and, and have a cabal that then remove them. Okay, well, let's, 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 no, no, wait, no, don't we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Okay, uh, Nick, we're, we're going that way. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to sort of actually add on to that point was that the days of the Washington Consensus um, that have had their heyday and the dominance of like the neoclassical economics, which you're talking about, is it's on shaky grounds now. But the um, you know, the, the biggest powers in the world, the largest economy in the world is calls itself communist with Chinese characteristics. The second largest economy in the world is run by an imbecile. And, so, and then Germany and Japan have never really been neoclassical economists. So, you know, to what extent actually is the, you know, the days of, of the neoclassical paradigm actually is over, where the world is now being run by another, uh, you know, other econo econ economic thought thinking and and, and systems, which might, which are probably just as bad or worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, sorry. Your name? Uh, Molly. Um, I wanted to ask really whether you think I agree with there has to be plurality in economics, but I also think it's it's useful and important to research what's going on now in banking and finance. I look at um, in relation to the actuaries. I look at um, the effect of pension funds on QE and QE more generally and the role of non-banks in credit creation. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking at Italian bonds and what's going on. Um, and I think it's a use, very useful to know what stuff's going on because how do we know, how do we critique it if we don't have to research? And I know that you can get criticised for just looking at the rules of the market or just looking at, at what's going on at the moment and the point is we have to change it. But I think going back to your point over there, I think you also have to, it's, it, it's more important, I think, for more people to um, look at this kind of area of what's actually going on in financial markets and the complexity, to be able to understand it and to be able to critique it, and then to be able to figure out how to um, approach it from a prioris economic point of view. Was well, that so you need to? Because there's one. You, your first point is you need to understand it, but then you're saying, and once you've understood it, you need to take the pluralist, uh, a, a purist. Economics yeah. perspective on it. Or, oh, Cloris. Okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, I think. I, okay. Um, so yes. Is there any hope we, we will never have pluralism because uh, uh, <laughs> uh, some people will rule and they their ideas will take over and actually have the rulers changed? Uh, and and uh, do we really need to know more about economics? Who wants to uh, start? And you have quite uh, Leon. I think. I mean, I, th I I think it's much more complex. I mean, we like to tell these 
easy stories about economics being a monoculture and so forth. And of course it's more complicated. If you look into monetary theory, as Anne has done, economists disagree utterly about money because, because it's so difficult to figure out what money is. And so there is a lot of pluralism maybe that is not really articulated and there is no wider debate on this or there is no way of translating different notions of money into, uh, into then more integrated models as economists like to use. Uh, and, and of course there's also pluralism across uh, countries. I mean, it's, it's evident that the, the, the sort of neoclassical or new neoclassical project to some extent is also associated with the Cold War and the idea that you know we're going to be all democracies very similar to the US. I mean, if you look at Arrow and De Brewer, who articulated the general equilibrium model in the 1950s, they were very much part of a Cold War idea of how uh, to organize and run capitalist uh, democracies. And obviously, it's clear that this is a very provincial project and not very, uh, how do you say, it's not the consensus these days that this should be the way it is. And Britain also always occupied a very peculiar place in this, right? Because you have a, an elite that's not so much defined by a discipline like economics, but it's more defined by institutions like Oxbridge. Uh, and so people can ha have a degree in history or, as we said, PPE and can still be sort of those uh, in, in the governing boards of important institutions. Uh, so it's a very, again, a very different kind of uh, trajectory. Um, and I think the, the, the plurality of possible ways of thinking uh, the economy uh, becomes more visible these days. And maybe that's a good thing, um, both in sort of geographic terms and, and uh, political terms and so forth. So, yeah. So maybe it comes just, it's a sort of, there's a difference between lots of people different having arguments in corners and no one knowing about it and power and who controls which idea sort of dominates. Yeah, mm -hmm. I must say I disagree with this idea of economists uh, serving just the 1%. Uh, I, I, I mean, maybe we should not discuss it here, but I think, I think there is still, the, the, economics is a sort of academic discipline and it has gone through a particular trajectory and the reasons it has developed the way it, it has I think have more to do with this particular institutional history and the ways in which certain concepts solved certain problems that economists right. had. It just so happens that the consequence of that is that the 1% are doing really well and the people at the bottom are dying. That's, just that, so happens. That, that's true. And, and I don't that's believe true. that's a coincidence. I don't That's believe true. that happens by I, I don't believe the, the world is run by economists. I mean, my understanding is it's, again, <laughs> more complicated in terms of who actually governs. But anyways, I, yeah. That's, well, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because, you know, sometimes people, you know, say, why are you bothering doing this promoting economic pluralism with economists? Because they're not in charge, and uh, uh, really. Uh, that's what they say, too. They yeah. say nothing to, so when the Queen said, why couldn't you see the crisis coming as well? We don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they would like us to think that they have no responsibility. So I, I, th I think that's dangerous. I mean, I, I feel very strongly they do have responsibility as a collective group, and they act as a collective group. So I, you know, and I agree you can't pin it on individual economists, but the consequence of the theory is what we are living through at the moment, which is a very serious crisis for millions of people. But I wanted to come back to the point about... Um, post-war. So post-war, the period from 1945 to 1975 or so is described by all economists, both orthodox and heterodox, as the golden age in economics. It is understood to be, have been a golden age when there was fair distribution of wealth, where there was greater balance and stability than there's ever been before, right? But Keynes had promoted his ideas, and all the time he was promoting ideas, he was being attacked from the right by Hayek and the London School of Economics in particular. So it was Cambridge versus the LSE. And the fight between Cambridge and the LSE was very public and very sharp. Right? So he goes to Bretton Woods in 1944 to construct a system which he, <coughs> hopes, which he and the others that were present, there were loads of economists there, hope would create a more stable world which would prevent the crisis of 29. And President Roosevelt, who was incredibly far-sighted, refused to allow a single banker to attend the Bretton Woods Conference. There were no bankers present, right? 
So they devised a system which would, from now on, manage financial flows across borders, manage credit creation, and manage the rate of interest as far as they could, and manage trade flows as well to maintain stability and balance so that you didn't get countries with massive surpluses and countries with massive deficits as we have at the moment with Germany with its massive surplus and other countries with deficits. And he wanted to prevent that. But he left Bretton Woods, Hampshire, New Hampshire, got on the ship, and immediately the bankers went to Washington and began to undermine the Bretton Woods system. And the Bretton Woods system that was then developed was undermined as it was being created. Right. So the idea that this was just uniform dominance by one sect or one person or one red sort of thinking is delusional. It was a huge fight, and it was a fight that carried on all the way until the Hayekians won. Mrs. Thatcher became, well, they won before, they won under Nixon, actually, and then, and then they won more, even more power over under Thatcher. So, so you know, it becomes terribly uh, uh, political. And then I want to answer the, the woman's question about the financial system beyond the reach of that we can see. Because there's the tangible economy which we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis and which we can all learn about and understand better. But then there's the intangible economy, the shadow banking system, which is beyond our reach, the globalized financial system, which is subject to no, uh, is not answerable, if you like, to any democratic government. It's, it's a self-regulatory system. And, and the, the idea of self-regulation is an economic theory. The economic theory that self-regulation means you will get equilibrium, you'll get stability in the end because the market will sort things out. And right now, out there in the, in the global financial system, we have a shadow banking system evolving, and we don't know what, what's up going up. We know that uh, actuaries are advising these pension funds. We know these, <laughs> these asset management funds. We know that they manage something like $6 trillion. And we know that they become bankers, right? And they, they are, are lending money. They're lending our money because these are pensions that we've, we've saved for. They're lending that to other big companies and institutions. Uh, and we don't understand exactly what they're doing, how much they, they're charging for it, what the terms and conditions are, or whether or not this is a system that can see. And the theory is, don't interfere. It is wrong for the central banks to get into, well, the central banks are deeply involved because they're providing um, safe assets for these markets to operate. But the theory is that you shouldn't interfere with this market. Because you know, if things go wrong, then those who are playing that market will be disciplined, and that it will be corrected, and the balance will be restored. Well, we saw in 2007 and 9 that those who created the crisis were not disciplined. In fact, they were bailed out by taxpayers. They didn't. They didn't. In fact, business since the crisis has been better than usual because they're now all backed by government. All the traditional banks are all backed by government guarantees. So this is a, I think you've raised a really important question, and it's very hard for us as ordinary citizens to understand what's happening there because it's invisible. It's invisible to most economists as well as you know to most commentators. I just Alex, one, one minute, one quick, and then we're. Uh, and I'm going to give actually I'm going to give Teresa a question because she's our new employee. <laughs> uh, she's just joined us, so I think uh, uh, she put her hand up. So I think she's allowed a, yeah, yeah. a, a question. Okay. I started this evening by saying. I agree with everything Anne said. Uh, I don't agree with everything Anne said all night. You know, so some stuff about slagging off actuaries, I have to disagree with. <laughs> um, to come back to Molly's point, I mean, you're asking what's going on with pension schemes, um, and I can tell you how pension schemes are feeling right now, and I can sum it up in one word: they are feeling fear. There is a lot of worry post um, the collapse of British Steel and the British Steel Pension Fund. There's a £20 billion pension fund called the, the Pension Protection Fund. That's companies that have gone bust and left their pensioners not getting their full pension. There's things like Carillion, where the trustees are being heavily criticised. I've been meeting this morning with the, the chairman of trustees of Carillion Pension Scheme. And, you know, he's getting heavily criticised. He's then pointing the finger at, at the pensions regulator, and I think he's right. But then the pensions regulator is having their finger pointed at the CEO of the pensions regulator, uh, what's the right phrase? Um, let's, let's call it, uh, di didn't have her contract renewed last week, right? <laughs> so, the, you know, spending more time with the family was literally in the, in, in the thing. So the regulators got fear. 
the pension trustees have got fear. There's just fear all around. And what that means is that they're rushing to buy guilt, and so there's fear in the guilt market as well. Uh, irrational, I think, because coming back to the point earlier about what motivates people and incentivizes people, fear is a huge driver that makes people act. And what that means is you are getting really low interest rates because people are really fearful for what's going to happen in the future. And indeed, they're fearful for their jobs and for their pensions. And that is what's going around in our, our, our economy right now. I'm going to take actually two last questions, three to set on the and one other person. And I'll take actually, uh, actually you with that, no, you've been uh, asking mm-hmm. the answer, so Theresa, and then we'll have very quick answers, but quick questions, uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll retire from one. Sure. Um, Leanne, actually, my question was to you. So I was very set, I mean, were you just figuratively speaking, or do you actually have on your courses often? people at the LSE who do not get accepted into economics, oh. and then how fruitful is it teaching them something that is a bit more pluralist in the sense of interdisciplinarity, because I think that would be really interesting to see yeah. whether this is what we're doing, what we're trying to do yeah. in both places. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I, knew to, I assumed that we were going to be questioning the assumptions that are behind all the models in economics, because... Um, that to me is the fundamental problem and unless we're, unless we're going right back to the foundational assumptions that we've talked about um, for example I've not actually heard anybody else say what seems obvious to me is that if you um, have a, an economic model you pricing things anything that's provided by nature is free it is therefore treated as infinite in the equations <laughs> and that is why we have unsustainability built into the very theory of economics. And until we change that, we're heading over the edge of the Well, that was very quick, so uh, we'll keep it. Right. Yes. Last um, quick point yeah, or question. Very quick. Uh, we know that um, in the inanimate world, there has been a tremendous development of knowledge. And um, in the, in the in- inanimate world, world, like the uh, inanimate nature, like mountains and people and bodies falling and electricity and all that. In other words, the conventional physics area. Now, uh, all this tremendous amount of knowledge has been raised or uh, achieved, in my opinion, because people have hit on the right kind of model that can handle or generate this kind of knowledge. Now, when we look at the animal world, in other words, the living part, especially human activities, there is no such equivalent knowledge <coughs> that has been generated. Now, my question is, where is the model? <laughs> where is the model? That, that, the that model can, uh, that, that can generate models. this kind of knowledge that is prevalent in the in animal world. Okay. Well, there are a few start. The Very quickly, yeah. I mean, we can talk about, about it perhaps uh, yeah. after. Uh, I mean, we get a lot of applications from people outside of sociology, from economists, people with finance backgrounds, uh, people with accounting backgrounds, uh, and uh, obviously, I mean, with with all these things, we have a prestigious brand LSE, and the prime motivation for coming to LSE is getting the brand. So my task is selecting the students and the. The first thing I look at is whether there is something like a pluralist motivation, I mean an actual motivation to think about the economy differently. That's the prime criteria for me. I mean, uh, yeah. Alex, do you want to... I I will give you your model that deals with all of these issues, um, but it might take me about 20 years' time when we've got a quantum computer that is more powerful than all the computers on Earth at the moment and that might just about be able to cope with the system. There isn't going to be one right yet now. But I'm half serious. I think artificial intelligence and quantum computing, when you put those two together, that's our only chance of getting a model that's going to deal with it. Challenging the fundamental assumptions, um, I do that a lot. Uh, it's staggering that you can get uh, an inflation curve on any date um, for RPI based on taking the yield between two government bonds. Yeah? And if you draw that inflation curve, that gives you an expectation of what is inflation going to be for the next 30 years. Compare that market inflation expectation with what actually happened in the market, there's virtually no correlation between the two. 
So what that means is the market is only telling you something about supply and demand today. Even when it's a 30-year projection curve, it's not telling you anything fundamental, and that's a very fundamental assumption, particularly in my business, and people make that assumption every day, and it's complete junk. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anne, for the last word. I, I think it will not be an economic model. It's not possible. <laughs> because because of the difference oh, yeah, between the animate and the inanimate. I, I agree. That's, that's the first answer that I agree with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, there cannot be a model. No. Because every model produces something that everyone changes. Okay. Can, can I just read some three lines from The Economist, which we sort of touched on? This was in 1997, their the lead article that says that it's quoting uh, Sam, uh, Paul Samuelson. I don't care who writes a nation's laws if I can write its economics textbooks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're all powerful. Uh, okay, with that, uh, I'd like to thank our panel very much for a very entertaining and lively uh, discussion, and to you too.